Ciao, everyone, and welcome back to Growth Talks. Uh, I'm your host, Raffaele, and my guest today is Danny Leonard. Uh, hi, Danny. How are you today? Hi, Raf. Good to be with you. <laughs> uh, this kind of uh, second appointment we had, uh, because actually I was a guest in your podcast maybe like a week ago, maybe less. <laughs> yep, yep, that's right. Uh, yeah, little, little it was super... Yeah, it was it was it was it was uh, it was really nice. It was really good. Uh, we had a good talk, a good shot. So I'm uh, really excited about this, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, second part. Uh, we usually start, you know, these conversations here with a, a very simple one, with a classic. Uh, tell us about your story. Tell us about yourself. Uh, you know, uh, who's Danny? Uh, you know, what you're passionate about, and also what you're doing at the moment. Sweet. All right. Well, I'll jump in. At a high level, let's go personal first. Uh, I am a father of two, a husband, a brother, a friend. Uh, I live in Los Angeles, California. I'm from Minnesota, uh, Minnetonka, Minnesota, to be more specific. And I spent, you know, the vast majority of my life in the Midwest. Uh, and professionally, I am uh, in technology. So right now I have a startup, which I co-founded with two others called Ramped. We are fixing the job search at scale for job seekers all over the place. The job market is really tough right now. We have, bunch, we have a bunch of free tools that get job seekers power uh, search and empower them to take their job search back into their own hands. And then we have some some uh, some paid offerings as well that make the job search super, super easy. But my mission today uh, with Ramped and our mission has been, let's fix the job search. Let's make it more equitable. Let's give folks uh, hours back in their lives and make it easy for everybody. And dare I say as well, uh, fun. Let's make the job search a little bit of fun. <laughs> uh, usually it's not fun, not at all. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you, you say that your mission now is to fix it. Uh, why did you use the word fix it? I mean, what's wrong with it? Yeah, so a bunch of things. I could probably go on for hours about this topic. I've been living in it for the last four years, specifically with Ramped. Uh, but before that, I've been a hiring manager to thousands of different sales manager, uh, salespeople. So what that, what that looks like back in the day uh, and what has actually existed for many, many years is you build this massive funnel of resumes. If you're talking about the hiring manager side or the employer side, and then you immediately, immediately, cut around 80% of those resumes for a variety of reasons, some legitimate, some because you can't handle the flow, others maybe at some companies for illegitimate reasons, uh, which we won't get into on this conversation. Uh, but what you're doing is you're building this big funnel for no reason. The reason that you're doing it is just because you want you know, to, to post a job and get as many applicants as you can. It's almost a vanity number thing. What, uh, what also is a huge problem with that is the resume by itself is a big, big issue. This does not share what you are doing today, who you are as a person, what your upside potential is, the skills that you have are not represented on your resume. The resume is very specifically supposed to just be a billboard of who you are. And folks don't understand that that is being used for a variety of different reasons. Some people want to tell their life story in their resume. Other people don't know what an employer wants out of their resume. And really what's happening with the resume today is it's getting sucked into an applicant tracking system uh, on the employer side. And that's just a simple piece of software that takes resumes in from all job, from all job search sites. It gets sucked in and uh, talent acquisition folks or recruiters are just looking for keywords. And that is what is helping or that is what is uh, uh, acting as the filter for a lot of these job seekers. It's just simply a keyword search on these resumes. That's not good enough. So when I say fix the job search, I mean, let's empower teams to use skills, to use upside potential, to use desires, to use who the person actually is, instead of what's demonstrated on the resume, potentially their LinkedIn, potentially a cover letter. Like these are silly, silly assets that we need to get rid of and replace with what is actually the person's skill set and their upside potential and desire to succeed in that role and then in, in, uh, in that specific company. 
I, I was talking with a friend, uh, I think a couple of days ago, uh, about something, you know, kind of related to this. Uh, we were talking about the fact that uh, most people on LinkedIn, they, how can I say this? Uh, they only show, you know, vanity metrics uh, in terms of, you know, the info they want to share, you know, the successes uh, they had. Uh, and you don't actually know a person from their LinkedIn profile. And there is something, you know, uh, you know, the, the hidden part of the iceberg uh, about that person, you know, the, the, the career that, that that person made uh, that you will never understand. You will never get it from just from the LinkedIn profile. Uh, and this is very interesting uh, because you say something very, you know, kind of similar related to this. So how can you fix that? I mean, if the CV is broken, uh, yeah. if LinkedIn is not enough, what's the solution? Is there a solution out there? What's the solution? So uh, oh, but I'm biased, but Ramped, we are building the solution. I don't think the solution, <laughs> the perfect solution exists today. I think this is many years out, if not um, a decade away, let's just call it. But the resume has existed since the 1400s and there's been very little innovation on the resume since that time. We are still applying to jobs the same way that my parents applied to job, drop a resume, send it to hiring managers, drop a resume, talk to your network, send, have them send it to hiring managers. Those are pretty much the same steps. Now, what can happen today is instead of a resume being the core asset or maybe a resume in the LinkedIn profile that you create, which there are tons of great benefits to both. Uh, what you could be doing is you could be chatting with some sort of either AI or some sort of platform that gets to know you on a really deep level. That's what we're trying to build at Ramp. That's what we're building at Ramp is once I submit to you, hey, look, I'm really interested in working in an environment that is supportive, competitive, motivating, uh, transparent. Okay, cool. Then the either the, the AI or the person or whoever it is in the future, whatever it is in the future says, okay, cool. Here are some ideas based on the things that you're looking for of careers or of jobs that could be a really good fit for you. Tell me a little bit more about the skills you have before I surface some jobs. Okay. And then you move further and further down the chain, right? So now, okay, here's some titles that I have. Here's some companies that I have that appear really interesting to you based on what you've told me. And by the way, we have three interviews lined up. They're already with hiring managers. You seem like the perfect fit. Do you want me to get you these interviews, right? So it's less spray and pray. It's less drop a resume that could represent you. And it's more, hey, I already know you or the, uh, the platform already knows you. Ramped already knows you really well. We know what your desires are. We know what your skills are. And we are proactively surfacing roles that are really good fits to you. Now, let's take this even a step further. So let's say that that's just one example of your job search. Ramped want, Ramp wants to be there for your entire career. So what does that actually look like? So let's say you're in seats already. You are uh, an individual contributor. I'll just use a, uh, an example that I know really well. So let's say you're a high-performing sales representative, but your aspiration is actually to be a marketer and it's to be a programmatic marketer. And you just have never told anybody that, but you think you could be really, really good at that. So in the background, as you're uh, being a proactive, uh, high, highly uh, productive salesperson, you're telling Ramp, like, hey, I really want to be a marketer. Can you please set me up for success as a marketer? And Ramp would ask you questions like, okay, do you have SEO skills? Do you have SEM skills? Do you know how to launch a Facebook ad campaign? And if you say no, Ramp will also surface curriculum to you. We'll say, hey, look, take this SEO course, take this programmatic ads course where you can launch a Google ads campaign or Facebook ads campaign, get the certification and then present it to your current hiring manager and say, look, I've been a great salesperson. I really want to go into um, digital marketing. Do you have a fit here at this specific company? If they say no, go back to ramp. Hey, hiring manager, or my, my manager said no. What else do you have for me? Cool. Here's three jobs that are not only willing to take a chance on you as somebody who is uh, a high performing salesperson, but no marketing experience, but they actually have interviews already lined up. They saw your profile. They know who you are a little bit. 
we've communicated, Ramped has communicated this to them already. The interviews are there whenever you're ready to take them. So it's more, it's more thoughtful. It's more based on skills. It's more just assessing where you're at as a human, as a professional, and then surfacing things that already uh, are available. You just don't know where to find them yet. Hmm. Uh, it feels like, I don't know if that's the right word, but to me, it feels like a kind of an assistant. Uh, is that, is that yep. a good word for it? Yeah, and, we, we think of it more as a, as a coach, but an assistant is, yeah. is great as well, right? So somebody who is, or something that is a career coach that just sits alongside you and you can chat with all, all the time, right? Like, oh, I just had this one-on-one -on -one with my manager. They told me I'm really good at X. I'm really bad at Y. How do I improve at Y? cool, here's a course. Do you want that? Or here's an initiative, like go talk to three people at your company that have done this in the past. Maybe that's a great, a great place to start, right? So it's a proactive career coach. And I like the idea of, you know, integrating uh, training in the process. Uh, that's quite yeah. cool. Uh, in, in your experience, uh, did, have you seen any, um, let's say, big changes, big uh, shift in the way you know, new generations uh, look for a job. Uh, I was reading an article, I think it, it was maybe August or something like that, uh, an article about uh, how, you know, Gen Z um, has very different, uh, you know, priorities um, when they look for a job. Uh, you know, for example, they don't care about, I don't know, like the, a car or, you know, an insurance or a, a phone, uh, those kind of perks. Uh, they won't, I don't know, uh, work from home, uh, you know, something completely different. Uh, have you seen any kind of, you know, important shifts uh, in, in, in this field? Yeah, so I, what, I, what I have seen out of Gen Z, let's, let's um, start with the, the top level insight on Gen Z. So Gen Z, they're, they're obviously the future. They grew up in the information age. They grew up with access to immediate, immediate feedback on nearly anything, right? They want to assess what a video game looks like they've already known how to search for it and they probably have 10 tiktok videos showing what that video game looks like and how to play it and all the guides right they've grown up in that environment where uh me as a millennial i got to see kind of both right i i saw a life before the internet and i remember my childhood being without the internet and then at some point it flipped right when i got to like eighth grade ninth grade like everything was was on the internet everything was online but the internet was just being created so i i know both and then you know further up the chain less and less uh of their childhood or less and less of their adult life was was with the internet so they know so much information they know how to search for it they know how to stress test it so for some of these careers and some of these jobs that are out there gen z already knows hey look uh i'll use uh, i'll use an example that i've seen a lot of memes on from gen z folks is If you're selling insurance and uh, there's major players out there that sell insurance or have that type of role, Gen Z has uh, a true perspective of what it's like and the downside and the upside. And often that's represented in like a short TikTok showing the odds and ends of how bad it is to be an insurance agent or how uh, you have to go, uh, in quotes, sell your friends and family on this insurance product before you go become a, a high performing insurance agent. So they already know kind of the good side and maybe the humorous downside. And what they're doing with that information is they're trying to uncover uh, rules that fit their specific needs or specific lifestyle instead of what I'm accustomed to. When I jumped into the workforce, my parents straight up told me, take whatever job that you can Uh, the first job that comes to you, run at it really, really hard, work your butt off, stay late. Um, that's not the same for Gen Z. That's, that's not the attitude that they're, they've been told. It's not the attitude that they've searched for and found on their own. That's not good or bad. I'm not having, I don't have a, a strong opinion on it. What I will say is, for me, my perspective is, I could not have existed in what I am today without knowing the in-office environment uh, of my first job. I was very fortunate to land at a tech company that was um, on an extreme growth path. It was called uh, Groupon. It's still around today. But that company, um, you know, I started as employee number 50 to 75 range, and it just took off, right? We were adding hundreds of people a month at some points, and it was rocket ship growth and they were bringing in top talent and I got a chance to meet and chat with and have meetings with some of the really 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 impressive people from all walks of life all age 
and I'm not suggesting office all day, every day, and it's mandated, but I do think there's a place that Gen Z maybe isn't familiar with and doesn't necessarily know what they don't know uh, on the in-office presence. So they may say, hey, I want to work remotely. I want to work whenever I want. I want to just plug in, plug, uh, log in, log out. But there is some benefit to having an in-office presence and to be around people that know different things than you or know more than you or know less than you, to teach, to learn from, to get mentored by those folks. And I don't think Gen Z has that perspective for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is some of their professional career has been impacted by a global pandemic where, where, pandemic where people just haven't been able to go into an office. So um, kind, of a, kind of a rambly way to say that um, – Gen Z is so innovative, so thoughtful, so creative. Uh, I think if they could ma- if they could pair that up with some of the really great stuff that was happening pre-pandemic in terms of office presence and in terms of uh, getting mentored or being around people that uh, that have t- seen it and done it before, I think there's a there's a really big win for for them, but also for the rest of the workforce as well to learn from Gen Z as well. Uh, thanks for the assist, because I wanted to talk about the pandemic a little. Um, how's the situation? Um, I, I'm always wondering if the, uh, you know, the job market is back to how it was in uh, 2019, uh, or you know, if the two years of pandemic kind of left you know, uh, something that you know, has always has changed the market forever. Uh, what's your what's your take on that? That's a good question. The I don't think it's back to 2019. I'll give you kind of the the short answer. Uh, we were we launched Ramped officially in June 2020, but really the pre-launch or the beta launch was January 2020. So we saw pre-pandemic the first scary part of the pandemic where everything shut down tons of layoffs right away uh the big boom back right hiring over hiring tons of people looking for jobs you know uh currency money flying everywhere from from government uh from government printing and then now which has just been this like slog of uh, let's call it like depression but i don't it wouldn't call it like an actual depression but depressed hiring cycles so we've seen a lot in this two, three, maybe even four year period. It's not back to where it is or where it was. People are still not going into the office. I don't think they're ever going to mandate, and some industries will, but I don't think anybody's ever going to mandate full time back in office with no exceptions. I think the, the future of work is hybrid. And I think it is probably these uh some part of the week in the office or some part of each month in office. And I think the ideal form of that is, is neither hybrid nor remote nor any of these taglines. It really is be in the office for the times where it is necessary to be in the office. And those times to me feel like brainstorming, feel like action, decision-making meetings feels like, um, where we need some cross-functional collaboration. And it is not, hey, show up at eight every day, leave at five every day, um, uproot your life to be in a specific location. Now, I will caveat that with like some some uh, teams do benefit from more in-office presence and not, uh, I'm biased, but I've seen a sales team, a really high performance sales team, in office and I've seen sales teams out of office. And I do feel like there's this emotional connection or inertia that is built by being in office. Now, um, you know, not every uh, industry is, is technology. So, you know, some healthcare, like actually being in the hospital, like to, that's, that's, you're going to have to be, uh, if you want to be a doctor, you're going to have to be in office, right? Most, most of the time. Um, but I do think the, the world is not back to, where it is, I think it will change. And I think, I don't think we'll be back to where we were, but I do think the future is looking bright and there will be benefits um, or a silver lining from the pandemic in terms of how we work and also 
mirror that with maybe some things from the past, but also where we're going in the future, which is this really cool collaboration or even like you and me talking, right? Where I'm in LA, you're in the UK, we can now do that. And that's accepted where before it was like, uh, you know, like everybody's in the office. If you're not in the office, then you're not part of the company. If you are enjoying this episode, please check out my lead generation course. You can watch it for free on gaito.link slash Skillshare, G-A-I-T-O. As an entrepreneur, marketer, or business owner, you know how crucial lead generation is. In this course, I'll be sharing with you 20 proven tactics for lead generation in both B2B and B2C markets. You can watch it for free on gaito.link slash Skillshare, G-A-I-T-O. You'll find the link in the description. I feel like, uh, you know, most companies are kind of, you know, still working on finding a balance, finding a solution, finding, you know, the uh, best way to organize uh, everything. I mean, yep. uh, I, I can see here, especially for, you know, like corporates and, and big, big companies in London, uh, they try to force everyone back to the office like for a while and it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, makes It sense. didn't work, of course. <laughs> uh, you know, after two years uh, working from home, uh, if you realize that you can, you know, like save money, uh, save time from commuting uh, and stress, you know, and everything else, uh, not everyone wants to go back, you know, five days a week uh, in the office. So uh, um, I feel like they are kind of, you know, building a new model, finding the perfect balance. Uh, and maybe, as I said before, each company is different, uh, you know, um, different culture, you know, different environment. Makes sense. Uh, I usually uh, like to ask my guest for some uh, tips and tricks for, uh, you know, based on their experience. Uh, and I want to do the same with you here today. Um, so do you have any like suggestions for, uh, you know, people that are looking for a first job? Then I'm asking, uh, I'm going to ask the same question in a, in a moment for people that want to build a career. But let's start with, you know, people that are kind of out of the university. Uh, they're looking for the first job. What can you share about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good question. Obviously, I know it from a, a professional tagline of like, what we what we recommend to somebody coming out of college. I want to put that aside and just talk about um, some of the places where I wish I would have up leveled and the advice I would give myself coming out of college. So I came out of school in 2009. It was actually a, a different um, crisis at that time. It was the, the global financial crisis, right? And I came out of the University of Michigan's business school being told for the last three years that you're going to get an investment banking job or you're going to get a consulting job. Those are the two paths. They're the most important paths. And that's all you should be focused on. And naturally, when I graduated, uh, those jobs evaporated. So there were some, of course, but, you know, the financial uh, markets and the financial industry was really heavily impacted. So I was lost, to say the very least. And I was really hard on myself at that point in time, too. So I wanted that job. I would, I would take these fin uh, finance interviews and the investment banking interviews, and I wouldn't be getting any of them. I probably got rejected from 40 different banks. And I thought at that point in time that I was a big failure. I, I felt, I felt awful. Like I, I had not experienced that type of rejection um, professionally. I really didn't even really have that much professional experience at that time, but it was like really tough on, on me and tough on myself. Uh, and I, uh, and I, I, I took it really personally. What I should have done back in the day is I should have been optimizing for some more risk or some more uh, riskier uh, riskier opportunities. So what I mean by that is take big swings, right? You want to join a big startup. You want to take a, a complete pivot in your career. You want to take some time off, whatever it is that feels the best to you in that moment, make sure the upside is there for you as well. So what I wish I would have done is really thought about, okay, what do I want in the next one to three years to set myself up for my broader career? And I should have um, been oriented around learning, around being around uh, the smartest people I could find, the people with the biggest networks I could find. That is what I wish I would have told myself. Now, luckily, I, I actually lucked into an environment like that, but that was not intentional. Groupon um, had some of the best minds in technology there. It had some of the brightest people, 
but that was not something that I had planned for. That was something that I lucked into. I would have been a little bit more thoughtful around, hey, look, take some time to self-discover what I'm actually passionate about. Try as many different things as I can. Um, at that point in time, I wanted finance. That's what I was set on. I wish I would have thought, hey, look, maybe it's important to learn marketing. How do you learn marketing? Take a marketing internship at uh, one of the coolest brands you could find, right? Go and find the 50 top brands and apply to be, you know, an unpaid marketing intern. That's totally cool. Or find a hundred of the absolute best entrepreneurs that you can find and, tr and cold message them and figure out which one will take you on as an assistant or a, uh, a mentee or an intern in any way that they will hire you. Be around really, really smart people. Be around the biggest network of people you possibly can. And the, the, the biggest piece of advice I would have given myself is it's okay to fail. I did not think that at all at that point in time. I was so hard on myself. I thought failure would define you no matter what part of your career. And I'm still learning. Like, it's okay to fail. Fail often, fail as many times as you can, but just make sure you're one kind of like failing up. That's a stupid cliche buzzword thing to say, but make sure you're learning from each failure and you're taking that along the way and try not to repeat the same mistake twice. Um, the other piece of advice that I would give myself is your reputation does carry with you. So uh, whenever you are thinking about a career switch or a career change or the next step, just remember um, the folks that you are around in that first career, the folks that you are with in your first path, uh, they, they are all going to be promoted at some point in time. They may even be your boss in the future. They may come back and work alongside you in a future career, future life, future job. So um, try to do right and try to be kind to everybody you work with uh, and try to add value to everybody who you interact with. Hmm. This is a great insight. I love it. And I have a follow-up question on that. Uh, I, I love the idea of, you know, you said try many different things. So experimenting is important also. We, we talk a lot about, you know, testing and experimenting on this podcast, uh, but we usually talk about it, you know, when we talk about like marketing, you know, this kind of stuff. But yep. uh, I, I understand that it's important also when you are looking for a job, when you're building a career, you know, when you are trying to figure out what to do with your life. <laughs> Uh, the the follow up question is you know related to the topic of working for free. I totally agree on that, but I also realize that it's kind of a you know hot <clears throat> topic. So every time I say to you know uh, I don't know, someone that messages me on online and ask for you know tips, I say oh go work for free for you know someone that you like uh, a startup yeah. or you know a creator or an entrepreneur. It's always kind of risky to say that, um, but what do you think on that? I, I think there is a like, you know, a moment in life when you have to do it. It's kind of like super useful. So it's probably a little more nuanced than just giving this like, oh, go work for free for somebody advice. Let's let's um, take a step back on that one. Uh, I am I am not in anybody's financial situation. So if you can't afford to work for free, don't do it. That's too risky, right? If you're not going to put food on your table, if you're not going to be able to support yourself or your family, um, that's, that's a, that's a red line. Like you can't cross that and that, that's okay. There's no tremendous upside for working for free versus not working for free. There are situations where that could be the case. I think it's okay to maybe work for free with some conditions uh, if the upside is warranted. So I'll give you an example of something where I would think in my first role would be able to work for free. If I had the opportunity to work next to Mark Zuckerberg back in 2009, and he said, hey, Danny, uh, I think your, your background is super impressive. Come be an unpaid intern at Facebook uh, in 2009, right? Like early days. Uh, and you'll be in charge of running some, some crazy cool social experiments, uh, with our, with our, with our social campaigns. That would be an, you know, that would be something where I'd be like, okay, I, I probably can't get this anywhere else. I would probably also recommend to myself that I do negotiate a little bit at that point in time and ask for maybe a stipend or to cover some, some monthly expenses. But that'd be an example of something with tremendous upside where I think probably work for free. Um, 
I don't always recommend working for free. I think you should certainly value your work, uh, your experience with some price. Um, and I do think it's really important for people to get paid exactly what they're worth uh, or more than they're worth for potential uh, upside as well. So I just think in the early days when you're starting your career, take big swings and make sure the risk reward profile is in line. Like you can shoot for the fences, you can shoot for the stars, you can shoot really, really high in those early days. Um, not that you can't later in your career, but there's more attachments, you have more responsibilities, you have more to to lose potentially. And in the early days, you really don't have much to lose. Like if you take an internship, um, let's say you're not even working for free. Let's say you're working for a very low amount and it fizzles out. You find that you, you know, I took a, I took a, a marketing internship and I realized three months in, I hate marketing. That's fine, right? Do right by the people you look, work alongside and find the next thing, right? You, maybe you want to go into customer service. Maybe you want to go into retail. Maybe you want to go into a restaurant. Um, just try things until one starts to click or feels like the right one for you. And, th and this is probably also a you know good suggestion for people that are always looking for like you know the perfect job. Uh, yep. If you experiment a lot, you have a lot of you know possibility to 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 find the best job for you. But I don't think it's going to be the first one. That's why you have no. to try a lot of different things. <laughs> I mean, some people get lucky for sure, yeah. and it could be the first one is the one they stick with, and. Um, You know, I, 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 my, my mom has been an accountant for her whole career. She's worked at the same place for nearly her whole career. That's just rare now. That doesn't exist as much. Uh, and if you are fortunate to land at some place that you absolutely love and stick with, more power to you. I have a few friends that have done that. And that's really cool. And it's, it's, it's a, I, I admire their career path because they have just found something that they love and have stuck with. But I think from what I've seen uh, building Ramped and from my personal life and my friends uh, and family, I just, I think that's super rare these days. Uh, mm -hmm. So keep trying until you find something that clicks and it doesn't have to be, Oh, I love marketing. So I'm going to stick with marketing. It could be like, I really love working with customers. I really love supporting them. And that could be the, um, the foundational piece that leads you to a restaurant or leads you to you know, working in operations at a startup leads you to somewhere totally different um, hospitality, right? Like it leads you somewhere totally different, but that core of like, I really like to serve customers and I really like to see them happy. That could take you a long way. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And uh, what about people that already have a job, but they are, you know, <clears throat> they want a career or they are kind of, you know, looking for something uh, better uh, in their job life. Any tips and tricks you want to share with us? Yeah. Um, I kind of balance this, this one. I've given this advice a lot. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. I, I, I'm somebody who doesn't like to settle. I will probably say I'm like more impatient than not. Uh, however, I do think, you know, when you are, feeling I'll, I'll put some i'll put some things out there there's no there's no direct framework on this one but if you're in an environment where you're not supported and there's no upside and you feel like you're working for a potentially a bad boss or a, a bad company it's okay to switch right it's okay to quit it's okay to switch um totally totally cool it's really hard to decide when that right point in time is between giving up too early and like when it's just bad like a bad fit i think you feel it in your gut first at least i have When you feel it in your gut and you know you're going to fight it, um, that's when I feel like it's time to make a change. Now, be a little thoughtful around that change. Don't just quit uh, sight unseen um, unless it's really toxic. Then, by all means, get out of there. Um, but don't just quit and don't have a backup plan in place. I think it's important to at least establish a plan, put some thinking around this plan, and figure out what you want next. Um, there's tons of resources out there today that didn't exist when I was Uh, at a career transition that can be helpful, not the least of which are located on our platform ramped, but uh, in other, other avenues too. LinkedIn is an amazing resource for you to stress test some of the things that you're thinking. So if you feel it in your gut and you want to make a change, search some of the keywords that you're feeling or some of the things that you're thinking, and you will find a ton of stuff on LinkedIn, Ralph. That's how we connected in the first place, right? There's just mm -hmm. tons of insight, tons of guidance out there that you can use. Um, You know, you can probably go to TikTok and find a hey, 10 steps to 
to make a change in your career. But there's just a ton of information. I wouldn't trust any one source quite yet. I would gather all the information and make uh, an assessment based on where you're at and based on some of the upside potential that you have. Um, I would not recommend quitting. I would not recommend burning bridges on your way out. I would definitely recommend being transparent with your boss uh, to the extent that you can when you have decided and when you have a plan in place um, to get out uh, and just make sure that you do your best to support the folks around you, to support your current company. But at the end of the day, you got to protect yourself first and you are number one. You're your number one advocate. You're your number one supporter system. So you know yourself better than anyone else. Uh, and you can almost throw every piece of information that I just every piece of guidance that I just did out the window, because if you're feeling really, really terrible in a work environment, you know, you, you know, first when it's time to get out. Mm. Usually if you wake up in the morning, you know, and, and you feel that you don't want to be in the office, <laughs> you should start thinking about, you know, I don't want to say quit, but you know, change something at least. Yeah. yeah. Something, something's got to change. And I, I, I yeah. respect that feeling. And I've, I've, I've acted on that feeling several times in my career. Yeah, me too. Me too. That's why I was sharing. Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, Danny, we usually uh, end these uh, conversations with a couple of questions uh, on, uh, you know, books and, and tools. Uh, I want to start with books. Uh, do you have any cool books that you want to share with us? It can be, you know, related to the topic of today, but also everything else. Something that you're reading at the moment or something that you really loved, uh, whatever. Something that can yeah. be useful for my community. 100%. Um, there is one book that has changed my life more than any other book out there. And I wish I read it when I was 18 or 16 instead of when I ended up reading it, which was like around 27. And that is the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Uh, an incredible book and a glimpse into history and recent history. So not so long ago that it probably doesn't apply or some of the learnings are like a little bit archaic, but enough of a perspective into business in the early 1900s, uh, maybe a little bit before of some of the, the legends of, of business back then and what they did in their time to set them up for success and some time-tested insights and, and learnings that have come out of that book for me as well. I genuinely wish that I read that when I was 18. It should to me be requ required reading for, um, for anybody who is pursuing a career in business or even thinks they want to go into business. Uh, so many, so many cool learnings, so much historical perspective. And I took a lot from that book. Uh, yeah, I recommend it to everybody. Uh, what about tools? Uh, do you have any tool, any software that is kind of, you know, really important in your day-to-day -day, uh, routine or that you, I don't know, use with your team or that you want to yep. share with us? We're, we're a distributed team. So the tools that we use most often to keep ourselves in check and keep ourselves aligned and synced up. Uh, one is Loom, one of my favorite tools. I actually got the opportunity to work alongside the early team in, I wouldn't call it a co-working space, but I was on a, on a project and they were working out of the same building as the team that I was with at the time. So I've seen them kind of from their infancy and uh, warms my heart a little bit that they, um, that they have, have achieved such such great success the product's amazing the tools that they come out with are amazing so we use them all the time uh i'm big on slack for distributed communication uh we use that often that's not like a unique or new tool uh per se but it's something that we've been leveraging quite aggressively today um and then you know if you're a job seeker i have to shout out ramped uh go to ramped it is a free ai based tool you will find so much value packed into the product offerings that we have. We have a cover letter writer that will write your cover letter that will save you minutes, if not hours right away. We have a resume builder that will build you a customer custom resume. We have interview prep that will prep you for any interview that you're, you're, um, you're about to embark on and it's all free. So you can use the base platform for free. Uh, You know, I, I, I got to give uh, our product team credit where credit is due. It is really impressive. And uh, my co-founder, Mitch, has spearheaded in a, a really impressive initiative for job seekers. Uh, of course, guys, I will share all the links in the description below. Uh, Danny, before 
saying bye, where they can find you, read you, follow you? So uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the best place to find me. Uh, I am super active. We post daily, post tips and tricks for job seekers all the time. Um, hit me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you want to communicate directly, you can find my email probably pretty easily from there, but shoot me a note. And I am always available, especially if you are a job seeker or you need some career guidance. I've been able and fortunate to speak with hundreds of thousands of job seekers since we launched Ramped back in 2020. And uh, I have a wealth of knowledge, not even tooting my own horn. I just have heard so many crazy stories, heard so many great stories, heard so many successful stories. And I want to share more guidance with the community uh, whenever I can. And, and your podcast, of course. Yes, the Ramp Podcast. Uh, I didn't even <laughs> shout that out, but then you can catch you on the Ramp Podcast in about a month <laughs> after this recording. But yes, absolutely, the Ramp Podcast. We're about to launch season four uh, very, very quickly. And, uh, and Raf is on that as well. So please come there. Uh, I will leave all the links in the description. Danny, thank you so much for your time. It was great. Thanks, Raf. Have a great one. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new. Make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and Spotify to stay updated on new episodes. With your support, I can continue to bring great content and great guests to this podcast. So hit the subscribe button now and I'll see you in the next episode.